On today's episode, we'll talk about the Ripper of Yorkshire, Peter Sutcliffe, who killed at least 13 women and attempted to kill at least seven others, setting off one of the biggest manhunts in the history of Great Britain. That story and more today on Two Murder Morons. This podcast includes adult language and graphic depictions of murders and murder scenes. This is a comedy-style true crime podcast. We do our best not to make fun of victims or victims' families. However, we do introduce comedy while telling graphic stories. If the mix of comedy and true crime is not your thing, this may not be the right podcast for you. Audience discretion is advised. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the show. My name is Andy, and sitting across from me, as always, always. is my good buddy, Mike. Howdy. <laughs> Are you trying to come up with something different every time? Yeah, I am. Okay. Gonna, yeah. No, I, don't, good, I, don't, I don't want to have a, uh, I don't want to be like, the, always say the same thing. Right. No, I get it. I like yeah, it. I yeah. like that you're doing People be like, oh, man, do, 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 do you have anything else to go with? Right. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, what happens when you run out of things and you're just being like, Yo, 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 bro, <laughs> yo, bro. yo, bro, yo, bro. Oh my goodness! Welcome Hello. to the show. Yeah, uh, we've got a, another doozy of a story. Or I see we're swimming back to England again. We're swimming back to I tell you what, Great Britain seems to they have some decent ones. They've got some good stories out of Great Britain. Yeah, and I don't know if it's because like all the stuff here in the U.S. we're so inundated with with other documentaries that it's like you know you I'll come across like a and I'm like oh I know all about that guy oh. Yeah. Um, you know, so like this stuff, like I've never heard of this guy. So that's why, I, that's why I want to do this show. Cause it's like, I've heard of the Ripper, but I haven't heard of the Ripper known as Suckliff. Right. Yeah. I've heard of Jack, well, but not Suckliff. Not Jack, but not Peter. Huh? Yeah. Not Peter Suckliff. Well, here's this dude here. Check him out. Jeez. Dude, he looks like Manson. Another he, one. He does. Jesus Christ. You know what? I didn't even make that connection, but he does Lord. look a lot like Manson. Yes, he does. Wow, oh, man. Speaking of now would be a good time. Yeah? Where's where's the look? I'm going to talk about watching the show. Oh, my God. Here we go. <laughs> hey, it's a necessary I know. Evil. I know. I know. For those of you listening right now and you're like, why the hell are they talking about pictures? We do also have a video version of this podcast so you can watch the show on either YouTube or Spotify. So tune in if you want to see what we're talking about. There. I there get my, there's okay. my public service. There's your now, public so service now. Mike loves so much. Exactly. All right. Let's jump into this dude here. Here we go. This is Peter Sutcliffe. He's born on June 2nd, 1946. Okay. To a working class family in Bingley, West Riding of Yorkshire. You know where that is? No, I don't. I don't either. But it's, in, it's in Yorkshire. That it is. I bet it's probably north. Think so? Sounds good. We need to get a globe. We do. Like we need to, when the Wheel of Death isn't up here, we need a globe up here so we can. Well, it wouldn't even matter if I, even if I said, well, it's 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 30 clicks from blah, blah, blah. We probably wouldn't even know that place. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's I true. mean, if it's not Liverpool or London, London, uh, right. forget it. Dublin or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, like something. Yeah, uh, Wales. Right. Yeah. Well, this is Yorkshire. You don't know. Your, you, what's up with that? You don't know Yorkshire, Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> is that where it comes from? I have no idea. I don't know. Oh, man. I have no idea. You should have, we'll look into that. <laughs> His parents... Were John William Sutcliffe and uh, his dad's Irish wife was Kathleen Francis Coonan. Ooh, Irish wife. Irish wife. Oh, that's usually not a, a that's not usually a good mix. I mean, I'm going to miss something here to you, Mike. Hopefully, my miss is in listening, but I'm kind of into the redheads. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying. I, freckles? Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ooh, Irish accent? Ooh. Oh, like a, oh. like a Reno era. Can we take a break for a minute? Like Reno era <laughs> yeah. of the day. Oh man. So anyway, mom mom is a Roman Catholic. Okay. And dad is a member of the choir at the local uh, Anglican Church of Saint Wilfrid's. Okay. Okay. Their children were raised in their mother's Catholic face faith. Face. I know. I know. I'm to say. Uh, so anyway, Peter here is raised in the Catholic faith, and uh, he. Uh, Sutcliffe Sr. briefly served, or I'm sorry, Sutcliffe, Peter, or this dude, he Peter. served as an altar boy uh, in the Catholic Church. There we go. He was a premature baby, having to spend two weeks in the hospital after being born, and his mother was the victim of domestic abuse. 
uh, making it likely she struggled through her pregnancy under great emotional stress. So dad was an ass. So dad's an ass, and this kid is having issues before he's even born. Yeah. Because dad is an ass. Yeah. Uh, Peter's father was a heavy drinker. Mm-hmm. How, every every episode, story, man. Every episode. Every episode is dad was a, well, last well, time was mom. mom. Yeah. But one of the parents is a heavy drinker. Yeah. And his dad once smashed a beer glass over Sutcliffe's head for sitting in his chair at the Christmas table when he was five years old. Well, at least he didn't, like, prostitute him out for three beers. Well, that's true. <laughs> He's just not as bad as barista. Barista? Not barista. Barraza. 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 But yeah, so can you imagine your dad, you sit in a chair you're not supposed to sit in on Christmas and dad busts a bottle over your head or a glass? Well, I mean, you think he would have known. That well, that's dad's chair. The head of the table goes to dad. Should have known better. I mean, everybody should know that. Uh, John Sutcliffe also hated his mother. So this is dad. Oh, okay. So dad hates his mom. H- hates his mom. Okay. Hates Peter's grandmother. Okay. And he is quoted as saying, she was a bitch and the le- least... And the least said about her, the better. Okay. I have to get used to the, yeah. you know, when you, over there, there's a different rhythm to how they talk. That just read really weird. So he said, she's a bitch and the least said about her, the better. So yeah, I'm sure he said a lot of it in front of him. The oh, kids. probably. I'm sure he said a lot in front of the kids. Probably. Um, his dad would frequently dismiss him because I, I guess he was a scrawny little kid. Um, and he would call him, quote, a wimp. Always hanging from his mother's apron, a mummy's boy. Oh, so he didn't, well, at least he didn't call him a hen. True. True. We learned that a few, a few episodes back. Yeah. yeah. So dad's on his, on his ass. Yeah. Basically. Dad's, yeah. Um, Sutcliffe's mother often lavished attention on her son and was to become seen by Sutcliffe as perfect. So he kind of is a mama's boy. He thinks mom's just perfect. Oh, mom's his idol. Oh, well, yeah. Um, dad would also whip his children with a belt. For a form of punishment. I mean, that's that's common back in those days. Yeah. Up till the 70s, early 80s. And um, his siblings later described their father as a monster. So all the kids thought dad was just a complete monster. Yeah. Um, according to Sutcliffe's younger brother, quote, the atmosphere in our house would change as soon as dad, dad walked came in. home. Yep. His life revolved around playing football, cricket, singing in a choir, beer, and womanizing. That's his kids saying... Yeah. That's about it. So basically, if dad comes home sober, the night's going to be okay. But if dad comes home drunk, it's going to be a bad night. Oh, for, exactly. For somebody. Oh, yeah, exactly. Probably most likely Peter, but yeah. When he was only four years old, Peter here is sent to St. Joseph's Catholic Primary School, where he was severely bullied. Probably because he's a scrawny little kid. Yeah, probably because he's a small little runt. And he's probably shy and sick of getting his ass beat from dad, so he's probably that meek little, you know. Now, I wonder if he had to stay there. I wonder if it was like one of those kind of Catholic deals. Oh, was that, it like a boarding school maybe? I don't know that. I think something just flooded my mouth. Sorry. I don't, I don't know. It's all right. Didn't hit me. In 1970, Sutcliffe's father, um, now this is nuts. Sutcliffe's father posed as his wife's lover. So basically dad finds out mom's having an affair. Affair, okay. So dad poses as her lover. I don't know whether that's through a letter or whatever, but he does this in order to lure her to a local hotel. So oh, okay, he's setting the trap. He's setting the trap. Honey trap. Hey, baby, mm-hmm. show up at this hotel. We'll have a good time like we always do kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So dad takes Sutcliffe with him and his two siblings. He takes oh. the kids to the hotel. For show and tell. Right. Yeah. And they, they witnessed him expose her infidelity in, in front of them. Great. This is what your mom is. Exactly. It's craziness. Mm-hmm. Uh, when she arrived, Sutcliffe's father pulled out a negligee from his mother's purse as her children watched. So she brought, she brought, oh, yeah, she, you brought, know, she brought yeah. a little something sexy. Of course. To wear, you know, so he grabs her purse, pulls out, here's what your mom was going to wear with this other man and whatever else he told them. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of crazy. Can you imagine being a little kid and going through? I'm trying to understand all that. Right. I mean, yeah, especially, what does that even mean at that age? Yeah. Some kid, I mean, if it depends on how old they are, they wouldn't have got it. Right. I mean, what? Now, it would have been different. They would have walked in on mom and another guy. Right. That would have been a little weirder. Yeah, it had been a lot weirder. Oof. In his late adolescence, Sutcliffe developed a growing obsession with voyeurism. Hmm. 
and spent much time spying on prostitutes and the men seeking their services. So he's hanging out like in the red light district, yeah. just kind of watching. Yeah, watching. Got the going to go bathroom stall type deal. And got the probably got the mirrors on his shoe. Yeah, yeah. Try he's to, turning into a little weirdo. Basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Reportedly a loner, Sutcliffe left school at the age of fifteen and had a series of mental of mental menial jobs. I was like mental jobs. He had a series of mental jobs. Wow. No, he had a series of menial menial jobs. jobs. Oh yeah, uh, including two stints as a grave digger. Oh God! At Bingley Cemetery in the late 1960s, because of this occupation, he developed a macabre sense of humor. Which I I get that you I work at that. a funeral, funeral home. home or yeah. cemetery. I get it. Coworkers reported that Sutcliffe enjoyed his work too much, and would even volunteer to do overtime washing the corpses. So he's like, hey, we need someone to stay late and work this weekend. We got too many bodies in. We need someone to bathe them. He's like, no, nope, nope, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> it's me. Pick me. Yeah, pick me. Pick me. Between November 1971 and April 1973, Sutcliffe worked at the Baird Television Factory oh. on a packaging line. So he's packaging Pack television. televisions and he's washing dead people. He left the position when he was asked to go on the road as a salesman. So I guess he didn't want to. He didn't want to. Well, yeah, he's a, he's a loner. Yeah. You, know, to, you it, would think that'd be perfect for him, but. Well, but well, he'd have to confront to, people. Yeah, he'd have to talk to people. Yeah, yeah I get that. Yeah. I get that. After leaving Baird Television, Sutcliffe worked night shifts at the Britannia Works of Anderton International from April 1973. In February 1975, he took, um, he took a break and used half of the $400 payoff to train as a heavy goods vehicle driver. Oh, so he like uh, he took a redundancy, which I think is like um, their way of saying, you know, like if it's a union job and they got a layoff go or, or like whatever, a layoff deal, and yeah. there's like a pay, like we're going to give you a payout or whatever. He, he took it and left. So he gets trained basically as a as like a semi driver. I yeah, think he's a trucker, right? Yeah. Um, on March fifth, nineteen seventy six, Sutcliffe was dismissed for the theft of used tires. This doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but well, but what? Yeah, I mean, what was he going to use them on? Like, he's, I don't know. Well, unless he's like selling them for money or something. Well, true, yeah, I guess. Uh, he was unemployed until October 1976 when he found a job as a truck driver for T and W H Clark Holdings on the Canal Road Industrial Estate in Bradford. Okay, so he's a Holdings. That's probably a little more like a. Uh, I don't know. It'd be quite equivalent doing probably a freight type job, hauling freight for somebody. Probably. Yeah. So Sutcliffe reportedly hired prostitutes um, as a young man, and it has been speculated that he had a bad experience during which he was conned out of money by a prostitute and her pimp. Uh-oh. So mm -mm. Um, other analysis of his actions have not found evidence that he actually sought the services of prostitutes, but note that he nonetheless developed an obsession with them, including watching them soliciting on the streets of Leeds and Bradford. So he's still got this weird... He's not like going up to, he's not like trying to hire him, but he watches, which is kind of a weird. Yeah. So thing. if he's going to develop into one of those guys that hates him, has a hatred for women. I don't know. Isn't that what Jack the Ripper was? Yeah. Did he go at, wasn't that mostly prostitutes? Yeah. Well, usually it seems to be the ladies of the night. Seems to be that's usually the choice of a lot of people yeah. when they're become crazy killers. Yeah. Sutcliffe met 16 year old Sonia Zerman the daughter of Ukrainian and Polish refugees from Czechoslovakia on February 14th, 1967. Valentine's Day of 67, baby. Wow, there we go. That's a time to meet. Look at, this. Look at that. Look at what he's wearing, man. Look at that. And, and he met her at uh, the Royal Standard Pub on Manningham Lane in Bradford's Red Light District. So he's still hanging out in the Red Light District, but it's a special night, Mike. It's Valentine's yeah, it Day. And people need love. And he meets the love of his life. Yep. At a pub. They married on August 10th, 1974. Oh, here's a here's his uh, wedding picture. Yeah, look at that. What where's where's she at? I don't know. <laughs> it's just a picture of him. Oh, okay. I don't know. Uh, I, <laughs> that is funny though. Yeah. Uh, Sonia was studying to become a teacher. Why? Uh, never mind. I digress. She's studying to become a teacher when she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Ah, that's why she's not in the picture. <laughs> she's hiding. 
Her relationship with her husband was later characterized by the writer Gordon Byrne as a domineering, with Sonya willing to slap him down like a naughty schoolboy. Slap him down like a naughty schoolboy. So he started to get a resentment towards women a bit. Oh, yeah, because here he's, like, getting rejected, basically. Well, she's domineering over yeah. him. So, yeah. He's, and she's a schizophrenic, and you never know what you're going to walk into. Yeah. Okay. It's reported that her husband, Peter, had to occasionally contain her physically by pinning her arms to her side during her common, unprovoked outbursts of rage. Wow. I feel like I've been there, Mike. Yeah, you probably have. Oh. This is like another one that's like, oh, I recognize that kind of relationship. Cool. Oh, wow. Hmm. Barbara Jones, a journalist who had many conversations with Sonia, described her as, quote, the most irritating, strangest, and coldest person I've ever met. She's so incredibly prickly and demanding. Hmm. Prickly and demanding. Sonia had several miscarriages, and they were informed that she would not be able to have children ever. Oh, okay, I get where she. I get where she probably uh, the, where the prickliness comes from. Maybe. Yeah. She eventually resumed her teaching training course, during which time she had an affair with an ice cream van driver. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't mean to lie. Just that's a, she's keeping it in the trucking industry. <laughs> It's an ice cream van driver, though. Well, maybe he made more. You would think he'd have heard him coming. You would have thought. (laughs) You'd have thought. When Sonia completed her teaching course in 1977 and began teaching, she and Sutcliffe used her salary to buy a house at 6 Garden Lane in Heaton, into which they moved on the 26th of September, 1977. Did the ice cream man move in with them? Uh, I don't know. Did he suddenly appear on their block, too? I bet he did. He might have. He must have. Changed course. Um, and they were still living there at the time of Sutcliffe's arrest. So this is the house. He oh, okay. This house. Yeah. Through everything. Yeah. So let's talk about the attacks and murders. Sutcliffe's first documented assault was of a female prostitute whom he'd met while searching for another woman who had tricked him out of money. So he's getting he's getting conned out of money left and right. So he's getting shit like shit at home, getting conned out of money. Right. He's probably developing a pretty heavy hatred for women. Yeah. Yeah. He left his friend Trevor Birdsall's minivan and walked up to St. Paul's Road in Bradford until he was out of sight. When um, Sutcliffe returned, he was out of breath as if he'd been running. Like the buddy noticed, like he gets out the van, he comes back, and he's all he's out all, of breath. Oh, yeah, he's all out of breath. He told Birdsall to drive off quickly. You know, get, he jumped, get out of here, man. Get out. Let's of here. go, let's go. Sutcliffe said he had followed a prostitute into a garage and hit her over the head with a stone in a sock. Oh. <laughs> what? Oh, we got to pump it right here. Okay, second. pump the brakes. Yeah, pump the brakes. Okay, so he, a stone in a sock. So it wasn't like a rock in a sock. We're talking like a stone and a sock. No. Are we talking like a sock sock? No, like a stone in a sock. Okay. Like, you know, that you would like. Yeah. Okay. Bam. All right. I just want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. I want to make sure we are on the right page. I don't want to be like, he hit her with a stone and then a sock. I'm like, where's the stock do? <laughs> He's just slapping her with a sock. Yeah. But where's, no. What's that going to do for you? No. Stone in the sock. Okay. Yeah, remember, I Ups, Upside the head. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that moronic break, but there we go. <laughs> okay. That's why we call the show what we call it. Yep. That's what it is. According to a statement, Sutcliffe Sutcliffe said, quote, I got out of the car, went across the road, and hit her. The force of the impact tore the toe off the sock, and whatever was in it came out. I went back to the car and got in it. Police visited Sutcliffe's home the next day as the woman he had had attacked had noted Birdsaw's vehicle registration plate. (laughs) Wow. Note to self. So, Well, I mean, at least she was with it enough when they... Well, that might be a lady of the night type thing. True. They you are know, pretty observant. Car pulls up. You kind of make mental note of the plate in case something crazy like this happens. Yeah. So she knew it was. Yeah. She knew it was happening. Uh, Sutcliffe admitted that he had hit her, but claimed it was with his hand. Like, oh. I hit her, but I slapped her or whatever. Self, you should have said self-defense. Right. The police told him he was, quote, very lucky as the woman did not want to press charges. Okay. So he probably wishes she did. Well, I think all the women after her wishes she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sutcliffe committed his second assault on the night of July 5th, 1975 in Keeley. He attacked 36-year-old Anna Rogolsky. 
who was walking alone, striking her unconscious with a hammer and slashing her stomach with a knife. Okay, so now we're going to tools. A hammer, Mike. Yeah. So we, we've we've left the Stone Age. Now we're into the uh, Gilded Age of the Iron. Yeah. Jesus. Crazy. Um, his little scene here was disturbed by a neighbor, and he left without killing her. So basically somebody else. Oh, he intended sh- to kill her. He intended to, but it, there's a witness, so he took off. Yeah. Uh, Rogalski survived uh, after brain surgery. She had a brain surgery Holy after shit. this. But she was psychologically traumatized by the attack. I bet. She later said, quote, I've been afraid to go out much because I feel people are staring and pointing at me. The whole thing is making my life a misery. I sometimes wish I had died in the attack. Ooh, that's not good. That's that's kind of. Yeah. That's crazy. On the night of August 15th, Sutcliffe attacked 46-year-old Olive Smelt in Halifax. Employing the same modus operandi, he briefly engaged Smelt with a commonplace pleasantry about the weather before striking hammer blows to her skull and from behind. God, he's got this thing with this hammer to the head, doesn't he? Oh, shit. He then disarranged her clothing and slashed her lower back with a knife. So he's got this weird where he hits him in the head with a knife, and then he's slashing at their body. Yeah, but what's strange. the thing about the clothing? I I don't know. What's that? Okay, I don't I don't know if he's like trying to get her naked or I don't. I, I'm I don't not know. sure. It just says that he disarranged her clothing. Okay, interesting. Hmm. Again, this time he was interrupted and left his victim badly injured but alive. So again, I think he probably would have killed her, but he's he gets spooked. So he pretty much is. These girls are getting lucky. I oh. mean, granted, I mean, not lucky, but they're getting lucky that there's a, somebody there that prevents him from going all the way, basically. Right, right. Yeah. So, like Rogolsky, Smelt subsequently suffered severe emotional and mental trauma. Smelt later told Detective Superintendent Dick Holland, Dick Holland. A, a dick named Dick, a dick named Dick, that her attacker had a Yorkshire accent. But this information was ignored, as was the fact that neither she nor Rogolsky were in towns with a red light area. Isn't it funny that over there you can tell somebody's accent? Well, there are definitely – well, Mike, let me tell you, as a trained actor. Oh, Lord, here <laughs> we go. Okay. Eye roll. Hey, you want to do that face again? Yeah, no, you know, okay. I, I mean, there are different – I, you I know, get dialects it. and stuff, and there, you know, there's Cockney, and then there's yeah, very I, like proper prim and proper British that the royalty has, and I get it, you know, it just uh, it's just funny. But really, I mean, if you think about us over here, you can tell if someone's from New York or if someone's from Kentucky or Alabama or if someone's from California. Sure, I mean, you they well, can, not always people from California. No, they don't all go around talk alike for sure, and. Yeah. You know, they don't. No. It's it's not like the Californians. No, no. I was gonna get on the four hundred five and take. Uh, the, it's not like Valley Girl, none of that kind of stuff. It's not. Are, Are you sure? Someone, it's like normal people. Can you tell if someone's from Texas? Oh yeah, they've got a pretty. Their accent's pretty distinguishable. Well, the belt buckles the size of a dish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just meant by their voice, oh, not by their well, look. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's something about accent. Yeah, accent. Yeah. You can tell if someone's from Louisiana. Yeah, you can. Nola. Yeah, I'm saying these are like lane. neighbor. I mean, these are like neighborhoods, though. It's not like a whole different state. Yeah, sure it is. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. No, it's not. I think it is. I think it's more like neighborhoods. No, I think it's like states. I don't know. They don't have states over there, do <laughs> I they? I think it is. Well, uh, yeah, their government isn't set up. Their area land isn't set up like ours, but they. I mean, same difference. Yeah, they're 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 Yorkshires. They're shires. They're. Uh, I mean, Kentucky is not a state. It's a Commonwealth. Right? Well, it depends who you ask. Well, true. True. I mean, if <laughs> if, if the license plate is written, he probably does believe that it's a commonwealth <laughs> and not a state. I'm just saying I can smell someone from New Orleans from a mile away. Well, yeah. I, I get know? it. Yeah. So I, that's kind of what I'm comparing this to is, but you know, well, who attacked you? All I know is a guy and he had a, you know, he sounded like he was from the South, you know, for us. Like he had a country accent, we would say, or. You know, who you talking like this? What's Yorkshire sound like? I don't know. I what's can't. Their, what's their dialect? I, I, I can't differentiate between them. Yeah, I can't either. They all sound like they're from England. <laughs> either sound like they're from England or you're from Ireland. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> much that's where I'm at. 
<laughs> We're going to get so many comments. I know. It's all from right. people. You, you know that like 10% of our viewership is from Great Britain. Yeah. I can see the comments now. Yeah. Like, oh, my God, you guys are complete idiots. Well, I mean, it's just, I'm just saying. No. If I hear somebody with a, a British accent, I just assume they're from England. Uh, yeah. No, I get it. I get what and you're I, I can tell the difference between Ireland and England. Now, Wales, I get a little mixed up on that. When you get into the Welsh accents, uh, I don't know. You don't know about those? Yeah. A little different. Okay, go on. Okay, let's continue. Let's continue before we get hate mail. Yep. On uh, August twenty seventh, Sutcliffe targeted fourteen year old Tracy Brown. Yeah, this isn't good. In Silsden, attacking her from behind and hitting her on the head five times while she was walking along a country lane with a hammer. I'm assuming it says, just says hitting her, but I'm assuming he should be killed for this one. Yeah. He ran off when he saw the lights of a passing car. So again, he's spooked. He's spooked. He gets spooked easy. Yeah, he does. He left his victim requiring brain surgery. Another one had to have brain surgery. 14, Suc- Sutcliffe was not convicted of the attack, but confessed in 1992. So down the road, he does confess to this one. Mm-hmm. Brown later said that she had been charmed by Sutcliffe at first, saying, quote, we had walked together for almost a mile for about 30 minutes, and I never once felt intimidated or in danger. So he's, you know, he's kind of like our Ted Bundy. He's a charmer. Yeah. He can charm the women into being comfortable, and then out of nowhere, he pulls a hammer out and hits them over the back of the head. The first victim to be killed by Sutcliffe, so now we're getting into the first actual murder. So it took four to actually get to a murder. Yeah. Uh, Was 28-year-old Wilma Mary McCann on October 30th. McCann from Scott Hall was a mother of four children. Mm -hmm. Sutcliffe struck the back of her skull twice with a hammer then inflicted a stab wound to the throat, two stab wounds below the right breast, three stab wounds below the left breast, and a series of nine stab wounds around her umbilicus. Is that her belly button? I think so. Okay. I didn't want to sound like an idiot, and I might still sound like a moron. It's all right. Umbilicus. We're not, we're not medical people. No. We're from a whole different line I'm, of work. I'm guessing that means her abdomen. Um, I think so. At 7.30 p.m., she was last seen leaving her council house on Scott Hall Avenue in the Chapel Town area of Leeds, walking past the nearby Prince Philip playing fields. An extensive inquiry involving 150 officers of the West Yorkshire Police. This is a big deal. Yeah. And 11,000 interviews. Holy shit. Failed to find the culprit. So they. That's a lot of work. They haven't figured it out yet, though. But they put a lot of man hour on that one. Yeah. Um, now flash forward December, 2007 McCann's eldest daughter. So this first murder victim's eldest daughter dies by suicide reportedly after years of anguish and depression over the circumstances of her mother's death and, um, the consequences to her and her siblings from it. Wow. So that's a long, I mean, that's a long time to, to anguish, you know? Oh Yeah. Uh, Sutcliffe commits his next murder in Leeds on January 20th of 76 when he stabbed 42-year-old Emily Monica Jackson 52 times. Holy shmolies. 52 times. Damn. So now he's strictly just stabbing him. Yeah, well, this one, yeah. That's a lot of hate. Yeah, that's the hate. I think that's the hate coming out. I think you're right. Yeah, that's a lot of hate. Uh, in dire financial straits, Jackson had been persuaded by her husband to engage in prostitution. Oh my God. That, that must, she must have been, they must have been going through some real financial straits for that. Yeah. To have to go to prostitution. Because I, I mean, I, I know this is a different place and definitely a different time, but I can't imagine being like, baby, we're broken. I need you to hit the corner. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah, I might be crazy. She made me do the corner. Right. Well, you wouldn't make any money. I know. Well, I'm I, just kidding. I, I love might. you. I love you. I'm my only fans with my feet. Hey, Mike, if loving you's wrong, I don't want to be right. I know. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, using the van, their family van, well, for the roofing business okay. that her husband had, uh, Suc- Sutcliffe picked up Jackson, who was um, soliciting outside the Gaiety Pub on Round Hay Road, then drove about a half a mile to some derelict buildings on Enfield Terrace and the Manor Industrial Estate. Sutcliffe hit her on the head with a hammer, dragged her body into a rubbish-strewn yard, trash-strewn yard, Mm -hmm. then used a sharpened screwdriver to stab her in the neck, chest, and abdomen. He 
he stamped on her thigh, leaving behind an impression of his boot. Boot mark. So there's more. I mean, a stabbing tape, but now he's like, she's dead and been stabbed, and he's like stomping on yeah, her. Yeah, stomping on her. That's and that's a lot of stomp, too, to get leave a, leave a boot print. Oh, yeah. To I mean, leave that's it a, a lot of force. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sutcliffe attacked 20-year-old Marcella Claxton in Roudhay Park on May 9th. Walking home from a party, she accepted an offer of a lift from Sutcliffe. So he's rolling up. Hey, you need a ride? And during those times, people... It was a tr- more trusting time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when she got out of the car to urinate, so she, I guess, asked him to stop because she had to pee. Yeah. He hit her from behind with a hammer. While she's peeing. Yeah. Wow, that's that's low. Claxton survived and testified against Sutcliffe at his trial. Good. At the time of the attack, Claxton had been four months pregnant Eesh. and subsequently miscarried her baby. baby. Well, I wonder if they got him on that murder charge. I wonder if that was around back then. Were they, because this, I mean, this is the late 70s. Were yeah, they doing that back then? Probably not. Uh, she required multiple extensive brain operations and had intermittent blackouts and chronic depression ever since the attack. Mm. On February 5th, Sutcliffe attacked 28 year old Irene Richardson, a Chapel Town prostitute in Route Hay Park. Richardson was last seen at 11 15 p.m., leaving a rooming house on Cowper Street saying that she was going to Tiffany's, a pub and disco in the center of Leeds. Okay. Richardson was bludgeoned to death with a hammer and had been stabbed three times in the stomach. It's weird he's going after the stomach so much with the stabbings. Yeah. Once she was dead, Sutcliffe mutilated her corpse with a knife. Okay. So he's graduating now yeah, into doing more sick yeah. stuff. Uh, tire tracks left near the murder scene resulted in a long list of possible suspect vehicles. Two months later... April 23rd, Sutcliffe, Sutcliffe kills 32-year-old Patricia Tina Atkinson Mitra, a prostitute in her Bradford flat, where police found a boot print on the bedclothes. Oh. Getting more evidence against this guy. Mm-hmm. According to Sutcliffe, he picked Atkinson up in Manningham uh, before driving to her residence. He then hit her on the back of the head four times to inca- incapacitate her. Sutcliffe then pulled down her jeans and pants and exposed her breasts. He then stabbed her six times in the stomach with a knife. So that's where he's getting his sexual gratification. Yeah. June 25th, 1977, 16-year-old Jane Michelle McDonald went to meet friends at Hoftbrauhaus, a German-style, basically beer cellar Mm -hmm. in Leeds. She missed the last bus home and went back to her friend's house to wait for her sister to bring her home. After 45 minutes or so, she ended up walking home where she was attacked by Sutcliffe um, on Reginald Street in Leeds around 2 a.m. Her body was discovered the following morning at 945 in the morning uh, by children in the playground between Reginald Terrace and Reginald Street in Chapeltown. So kids find her body. A postmortem exam was carried out by the home office pathologist, Professor David Gee. The extent of her injuries was not revealed at the time by police, although it was subsequently revealed she had been hit on the head three times with a hammer and had been stabbed in the chest and back. A broken bottle was found embedded in her chest. Wow. Like, a uh, broken bottle embedded in the chest. That's... Oh, yeah. Insane. That's, that's his, his hatred. The following month, July 10th, 1977, Sutcliffe assaulted 43-year-old Marine Long in Bradford. Long was leaving the nightclub when Sutcliffe offered her a lift home. Long stopped to urinate, and Sutcliffe struck her on the head, knocking her out. Got another one. Long was suffering from hypothermia when found and was in a hospital for nine weeks. A witness misidentified the make of Sutcliffe's car, resulting in more than 300 police officers checking thousands of cars without success. That sucks. So if, you know what I yeah. mean? Oh, yeah. Like it's like here, well, it wasn't an F one fifty, it was a Dodge Ram. So they're out there stopping all these Dodge Rams and they're never gonna find the find I the right one. On October first, nineteen seventy seven, Sutcliffe murdered twenty twenty year old Jean Bernadette Jordan, a prostitute from Manchester. Shortly after nine PM, Sutcliffe was cruising in the area of Moss Side when he picked up Jordan. After they arrived in Princess Road near the Southern Cemetery, Sutcliffe hit Jordan once in the head before proceeding to hit her 10 more times. In a later confession, Sutcliffe said he had realized the new five pound note he had given to Jordan was traceable. 
So she, he picked her up as a prostitute, I think. Paid her. Paid her, and then was like, shit, that's traceable. I got to kill her. Yep. Jesus. After hosting um, a family party at his new home, he returned to the wasteland behind Manchester's Southern Cemetery where he had left the body, but he was unable to find the note. So he paid her. It wasn't a shit. She's going to, he kills her, dumps the body, goes home to a party. And then, is, then he's like, shit, I gave, yeah, her money. I gave her money. So he goes back to but find it. Traceable. I, maybe he's just in his le- head. In his head. Yeah, yeah. I guess. Uh, it has numbers on it. Right. On uh, October 9th, Jordan's body was discovered by local dairy worker and future actor Bruce Jones. Do you know who Bruce Jones is? <laughs> Maybe he's famous over there. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, he could be, yeah. Um, who had an allotment of land adjoining the site and was searching for house bricks when he made the discovery. The note hidden in a secret compartment in, compartment in Jordan's handbag was traced to branches of the Midland Bank in Shipley. Okay, so it was traceable, Mike. Oh, what a how it was. So they found the note in her purse, in her handbag, and they were able to trace it back to the, the bank, basically, that it came from. Oh, okay. So not back to him, but they at least traced it. We know that this was issued out of this bank. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess so. Police analysis of bank operations allowed them to narrow their field of investigation to 8,000 employees who could have received it in their wage packet. Over three months, the police interviewed 5,000 men, including Sutcliffe. The police found that the alibi given for Sutcliffe's whereabouts, that he had attended a family party, was credible. So he he lucked out that he had gone home to that party. Yeah. He said, well, I was at a party at my house. And then they interviewed. Yeah, he was here. Yeah. So it kind of gets him out of there. So Bruce Jones was, yeah. was an actor. Yeah. like a. Yeah, he played in uh, Les Battersby. And what? Les Battersby. And he was also in Coronation Street. Don't you remember that? Are you being sarcastic right now? Because right. I haven't heard of either one of those. I haven't either, but there's, well, he was in. His real name is Ian Royston Jones. Or maybe Ian. 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 So basically, what you're saying is right now, there are more people from Great Britain typing comments on this video mm-hmm. about how big of morons we are for not knowing what these I have no idea. Never productions are. Never, never heard of them. Um, He had a teacher who encouraged him to become an actor. That's all I know. Okay. And he, uh, I, I haven't heard, uh, he was in the full Monty. I have Re- heard of that. Okay. I do know that. Yeah. Well, and, and he also appeared with Bob Hoskins in the Shane Meadows film 24 seven. Okay. Okay. So there's two. I still can't picture him though. Okay. And was, I can't picture him, but yeah. I, I recognize some of the, Yeah. Yeah. All right. So don't criticize us too much. Okay. (laughs) Weeks of intense investigations pertaining to the origins of the five pound note led to nothing, leaving investigators frustrated that they collected an important clue, but have been unable to trace the actual firm to which of whom the note had been issued. That'd be crazy if they could have actually. I mean, they did because they interviewed him and he came up with that alibi. So they were close. They had him. Yeah. They just didn't know they had him. amazing how close they could have came. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine that with money here? No. I mean. Yeah. I don't know how you. Well, I I don't know. Do banks keep track? Like if I pulled a 20 out of my wallet right now and they could they run the serial number and something and say, oh, well, that came from the Chase Bank over here. I don't think so unless it's part of their die pack money. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's the only thing that's traceable, isn't it? I don't know. If you work at a bank here in the U.S., leave us a comment and let yeah, us know. Like, so. do banks scan all the bills and it's traceable? Like, what branch they're issued out of? That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. On December 14th, Sutcliffe attacked Marilyn Moore, a 25-year-old prostitute, in the back of his car on waste ground in Scott Hall. Sutcliffe lost his balance while delivering a blow to Moore with a hammer, allowing Moore to escape with severe head injuries. So he basically fell over and she rolled out yeah, of it. Yeah, she took off. Yeah. Um, tire tracks found at the scene match those from an earlier attack. So now they're piecing together. These are all, I mean, I think they knew these were all related yeah, at this I think point. So too, yeah. The resulting photo fit bore a strong resemblance to Sutcliffe. Photo fit, I think, is their term of, um, you know, uh, what do they call that? The police drawing. Oh, yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Sketch artist. Sketch, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it bore a strong resemblance to Sutcliffe. 
Sutcliffe as had those from other survivors and more provided a good description of Sutcliffe's car, which had been seen in red light areas. Sutcliffe was interviewed on this issue, which, I mean, they're getting close. Yeah, right? getting close, but still not there. Police discontinued the search for the person who received the five-pound note in January of 78. Although Sutcliffe was interviewed about the matter, he was not investigated further and was contacted and disregarded by the Ripper Squad on several further occasions. I just love that they had the Ripper Squad, the Ripper Squad working yeah. the case, which it might be something that they named Could specifically be. for this, Could you be. know, investigation. Yeah, maybe it's just like a. Uh, I don't know what you would compare it to. I, I'm trying to think of a case where they named, you know, the group that's specifically investigating, you know, they yeah. named it something, Operation whatever. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Mm -hmm. Now, here's what's crazy. You would think, so he's been interviewed by police twice. The second time being, the reason we're talking to you is you're involved somehow with this five-pound note. You're You drive the car that they're saying is the person doing this. You look a whole hell of a lot like this drawing, but they didn't have enough. So you would think you would cool it, but that month. Well, because it's all circumstantial at this point. I'm just saying as an offender, yeah. you realize they're getting close. Maybe he didn't think they were close. Yeah, maybe he's got he's cocky about it. Like, Well, at this point, he probably is. I've yeah. gotten away this long. Yeah, that's true. You know, maybe he's to the point he's just going to do it until he gets caught. He don't care. Yeah. He's going to continue it until he gets caught. Could be. Well, that same month after he was interviewed the second time, Sutcliffe killed Yvonne Ann Pearson, a 21-year-old prostitute from Bradford, uh, on January 21st of 1978. He repeatedly bludgeoned her on the head with a ball-peen hammer. Oh, God. Um, he then jumped on her chest before stuffing horsehair into her mouth from a discarded sofa under which he hid her body near Lum Lane. So he hits her on the head with a ball-peen hammer, jumps on her chest, stuffs her mouth full of horse hair, which I guess at the time they used to stuff couches. I guess. And yeah. then put her body under it and left it there in the alley or wherever, you know, the yeah. wasteland. The wasteland. They keep calling it. Dump. Ten days later, on January 31st, Sutcliffe killed Elena Helen Ritka, an 18-year-old prostitute from Huddersfield, striking her on the head five times as she exited his vehicle before stripping most of her clothes from her body, although her bra and polo neck jumper were positioned above her breasts and, re and repeatedly stabbed her in the chest. Her body was found three days later beneath railway arches in Garin's timber yard, to which he had driven her. Sutcliffe said Ritka, while in police custody in 1981, oh, Sutcliffe said of Ritka. Of Ritka. In 1981, I had the urge to kill any woman. The urge inside me to kill girls was now practically uncontrollable. Yep. Well, that explains it. I was saying, well, why wouldn't you to cool it off? Well, if you've got that thing inside you, it's yeah. just uncontrollable. He, he just can't stop. He's, he's got that taste. Yeah, he doesn't care. He yeah. just needs he to just, kill. He's got to satisfy. He's not satisfied anymore. He's yeah. trying to find that satisfaction. He's trying to get that high and that satis satisfaction he got on the first one. Right. Yeah. He's going to continue to chase that. Yeah. And I don't think there's any stopping him now no. other than catching him. Yeah. Vera Evelyn Millward, 40, was a prostitute who left her home in Cholton on Medlock at 10 p.m. on May 16th, 78, telling her boyfriend that she was going out to buy cigarettes. Sutcliffe picked up Millward, and after she got out of his car, Sutcliffe attacked her with a hammer. After she died, Sutcliffe dragged her body against a fence and began to stab her repeatedly with a knife. Yeah, I think that I think that's his... That's just his M.O. I think it's part of his sexual M.O. You think so? I kind of have a feeling. think this is sexual for him? Uh, I think so, yeah. Partially. Yeah. On April 4th, 1979, Sutcliffe killed Josephine Ann Whitaker, a 19-year-old clerk whom he attacked on Seville Park Moor in Halifax, West Yorkshire, as she was walking home. Sutcliffe hit Whitaker from behind with his ball-peen hammer and had hit her again as she lay on the ground. Sutcliffe then proceeded to stab her 21 times with a screwdriver in the chest and stomach. God, that screwdriver thing is, ugh. Yeah. And six times in the right leg before also thrusting the screwdriver into her vagina. Mm -hmm. So now he's, oh, yeah, that's the first one. Mm -hmm. mm. Whitaker's skull was fractured from ear to ear. Wow. Mm -mm -mm. 
Despite forensic evidence, police efforts were diverted for several months following the receipt of a taped message purporting to be from the murderer. Oh. Taunting Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield of the West Yorkshire Police, who was leading the investigation. The tape contained a man's voice saying, quote, I'm Jack. I see you're having no luck catching me. I have the greatest respect for you, George, but Lord, you're no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. Okay. Just interesting. Interesting. Based on the recorded message, police began searching for a man uh, with a wareside accent. So here we are with the accents again. Apparently a very specific type so of I accent. I think he's from a, this guy's from this area, and but he's actually from this area. Yeah. So the police are wrong. So li- they were using linguists at this point to listen to this tape, and they narrowed it down to Castletown uh, area of Sunderland. So, man, they can really narrow down these accents, oh, apparently. Yeah. Um. The hoaxer dubbed Wareside Jack sent two letters to police in the Daily Mirror in March 1978, boasting of his crimes. The letter signed Jack the Ripper claimed responsibility for the murder of 26-year-old Joan Harrison in Preston in 1975. Hmm. And this is, I think we'll talk about this here in a second. This is just kind of interesting. They were putting billboards up like this. Help us stop the Ripper from killing again. And there's a sample of his handwriting on the billboard. And then there's a phone number people could call to listen to that recording. Like help us if you know this voice. Yeah. Um, it's just crazy. They're going all out. I mean, that's good. Obviously I trying need to, to. Yeah. Uh, the hoaxer case was reopened in 2005 and DNA taken from envelopes was entered into the national database. So now we're way in the future. We're just talking about these letters and the tape, right? Oh, uh, what year was this? The 2005. Okay, so yeah, DNA. Is, they take okay. yeah, they take DNA off the letters. Okay, off good. The envelopes. Okay, and they put it in the national da- database. The DNA matched that of John Samuel Humble, an unemployed alcoholic and longtime resident of the Ford Estate in Sunderland, a few miles from Castletown, whose DNA had been taken following a drunk and disorderly offense in 2001. On October 20th, 2005, Humble was charged with attempting to pervert the course of justice for sending the hoax letters and tape. So they realized that this isn't the actual killer sending, you know, yeah. they call it the hoaxer. Yeah. And they charge him with it because yeah. he's hindering their investigation by which, causing confusion. Which you should. Yeah. Everybody should. So I'm glad. I just love, I love the way they word stuff. His charges were attempting to pervert the course of justice. I just love their, dis- it's so much like prettier than yeah, the, it is. the stuff yeah, we, we use. Yeah. <laughs> We're just like obstruction. Obstruction or justice. <laughs> well, you can't arrest him if it's a family member. Uh, he was taken into custody on a March 26, 2006. He was convicted and sentenced to eight years in prison for that. Damn, that's good. They took that seriously. Well, he should have. Humble died on July 30th, 2019 at age 63. So that's just that. That's the hoax case. So yep. now we're getting back to the murder. Getting back to the Ripper. Yeah. So um, on September first, I believe of seventy eight, Sutcliffe murdered twenty year old Barbara Janie Babs Leach, a Bradford University student. Her body was dumped at the rear of thirteen Ashgrove under a pile of bricks close to the university and her lodging. The murder of another woman who was not a prostitute again alarmed the public and prompted an expensive publicity campaign emphasizing. The Wareside connection. So this is this is all part of that confusion. Yeah. That he's from Wareside and what's prompting all these um, billboards and stuff because this is a murder of a woman who's not a prostitute. Correct. So now people are freaked out because – Yeah, that's not – yeah. You know, there's a thought like, well, I'm safe. I'm not – I don't – Not a prostitute. Like, you know, I don't work the streets at night or whatever. But yeah. now when women that aren't start – it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, shit it's college kids. It's, it's everybody it's now. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, he's – Getting too well known in the in the red light district. Got to step away from it. Yeah. So d- despite the false lead, Sutcliffe was interviewed on at least two other occasions in 1979. Wow. So they interviewed this dude four, four times. times. Wow. Despite matching several forensic clues and being on the list of 300 names in connection with the five pound note, he was not strongly suspected. How he like? They should have taken his DNA back then. Dang. Just to man. hold on to it. Someday this might be uh, valuable. All right, June 26, 1980. 
Sutcliffe is stopped while driving, tested positive for drunk driving, and was arrested. Oh. So he gets stopped for okay. DUI. While he's awaiting trial for this um, in mid-January 1981, um, he kills again. So this he's uncontrolled. I mean, yeah. he's out of control because he's, he's basically like out on bond or something. He kills 47-year-old civil servant Marguerite Walls on the night of August 20th, 1980. She left her office between 9.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. to walk to her home in Farsley. He incapacitated her with a hammer blow to the back of the head as he continued to strike her while yelling, quote, filthy prostitute. Although she's not, but he's attacking her and yelling. Because she's out at night. Right. In order to move her 20 yards from the place of the attack up a driveway and into a high wall garden, he first tied a length of rope around her neck and tightened it. She choked her there, kneeling on her chest, and removed almost every piece of clothing from her once she was dead, leaving just her tights. He partially covered the body with grass and leaves before he left. Wow. He's out of control at this point. Oh, yeah. On September 24th, 1980, 34-year-old doctor from Singapore, 34-year-old doctor, Yupada Bandera, was walking home from meeting friends when Sutcliffe followed her into an alley, he struck Bandera on the head, rendering her unconscious. Then, when he was startled, dragged her along the street with a rope around her neck. So his new thing is, is to almost like a leash and dragging them yeah. with him. That's nuts. Uh, Marine Mo Lee, 21, an art student at Leeds University, was attacked by Sutcliffe on October 25th, 1980. She was in a pub with friends in the Chapeltown neighborhood of the city when she was attacked as she hurried down a dark street to catch a bus home. Wow. Lee was suffering from significant wounds when she awoke in the hospital, including a puncture hole to the back of her skull, a fractured skull, a fractured cheekbone, a broken jaw, a severed spinal cord, and numerous scratches and bruises. Severed spinal cord? Yeah. Oh, she's screwed. 16-year-old Teresa Sykes was attacked in her Huddlesfield. Another minor. I know. Um, November 5th, 1980, Sykes was going to a shop in Oaks Huddlesfield when Sutcliffe hit her from behind. Sykes' boyfriend heard her screams and ran out, scaring Sutcliffe off. Sykes was recovering from brain surgery when Sutcliffe was arrested. Mm. On November 25th, 1980, Trevor Birdsall, the friend, remember in the van? Yep. Um, who was like the unwitting getaway driver. Yeah. He didn't know what this one yeah. was, but he was a getaway <laughs> driver for his first documented assault all the way back in 69. Yeah. Reported him to police as a suspect. Oh. In total, Sutcliffe had been questioned by the police on nine separate occasions in connection with the Ripper inquiry before his eventual arrest and conviction. Wow. But before they get him, so it just keeps going, man. 20-year-old Jacqueline Hill, a student at Leeds University, was murdered on the night of November 17th, 1980. She was returning home to her student's hall of residence in Headingsley, Leeds, when Sutcliffe delivered a blow to her head before removing her clothes and stabbing her repeatedly in the chest and once in the eye with Ooh. a screwdriver. Oh. I don't know if she was dead at that point. All right, finally, hopefully, finally, we're hoping. Hoping. On January 2nd, 1981, Sutcliffe was stopped by police with 24-year-old prostitute Olivia Rivers in the driveway of Light Trade's house on Melbourne Avenue in Broomhill, Sheffield, South Yorkshire. A police check by probationary constable Robert Hydes. So you got, it's the new dude in training. Yeah, yeah. It's the one that get, revealed that Sutcliffe's car had false plates. He oh. was using f a fake license plate. Sutcliffe is arrested and transferred to Dewsbury Police Station in West Yorkshire. Are they arresting him for that? Hey, that might be a major offense over there. Yeah, could be. At Dewsbury, Sutcliffe was questioned in relation to the Ripper case as he matched many of the known physical characteristics. Of course. The next day, Sergeant Robert Ring decided on a hunch to return to the scene of arrest where he discovered a knife, hammer, and rope that Sutcliffe had discarded behind an oil storage tank when he briefly slipped away after telling police he was, quote, bursting for a pee. Mm. So while while he was being arrested, guys, I really can I just go over here and pee real quick? Sure, man. So and I can give her my he dumped tools. Everything. And luckily, the sergeant was like, "I'm gonna go see if he dumped anything." Well, sure enough, he did. Smart guy. 
Sutcliffe hid a second knife in the toilet at the police station when he was permitted to use the toilet there. The police obtained a search warrant for his home in Heaton and brought his wife in for questioning. <laughs> I wonder if she was just completely caught off guard. Probably. When Sutcliffe was stripped at Dewsbury Police Station, he was wearing an inverted V-neck jumper under his trousers. Ah. The sleeves had been pulled over his legs, and the V-neck exposed his genital area. So, like a base, what a long sleeve V-neck shirt, right? Upside yeah. down. Yeah. Over. Yeah. <laughs> what a look that probably was. I'm sure. the f- The fronts of the elbows were padded to protect his knees. Okay, so this is another. So, like the, it's a padded shirt, but they're, they're working as knee pads. Yes. So presumably when he's kneeling over his victims, he's not hurting his knees. Correct. The sexual implications of this outfit were considered obvious, but it was not known to the public until being published in 2003. After two days of intensive questioning on the afternoon of January 4th, 1981, Sutcliffe suddenly admitted that he was the Yorkshire Ripper. He just couldn't, uh, couldn't, couldn't hold it out anymore. Couldn't hold it in. That's great. I would love to see that, like, I mean, we've all seen those interviews. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, no, no. And then out of nowhere, they're like, okay, yep, I'm, I'm yeah, a ripper. Yeah, 18 hours later. Right. That's yeah, me. That's me. After they're finally broken down. Yep. Over the next day, he calmly described his many attacks. Several weeks later, he claimed God had told him to murder the women. Oh, now it's God. He's one of those. Okay. Saying, quote, the women I killed were filth. So he's saying he's doing justice for the city. Right. But not all of them were f- not, prostitutes. That's the thing. Not all of them were. Yeah. Just because he says they are. One's a doctor. Yeah, one, one, college students. A bunch of them were college students. Minors. He just thought they were, I guess. Yeah. He told the police, quote, bastard prostitutes who were littering the streets. I was just cleaning up the place a bit. He probably thinks he should get an award. Probably. I mean, he does. Key, to the, key to the city. Yeah. Well, he gets a key. Oh, no, he doesn't get well, that. Uh, in a way. <laughs> they throw away the key. Well, yeah. Sutcliffe displayed regret only when talking of his youngest murder victim, Jane McDonald, mm-hmm. and showed emotion when questioned about the killing of Joan Harrison, of which he, uh, which he denied having carried out. Harrison's murder had been linked to the Ripper killings by the Wareside Jack claim. But in 2011, DNA evidence revealed the crime had actually been committed by convicted sex offender Christopher Smith, who had died in 2008. Hmm. Sutcliffe was charged on January 5th, 1981. At his trial, he pleaded not guilty to 13 charges of murder, but guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. So here's another one, basically insanity. Claim. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The basis of his defense was that he claimed to be the tool of God's will. Sutcliffe said he had heard voices that ordered him to kill prostitutes while working as a grave digger which he claimed originated from the headstone of a Polish man, Bronozov Zapolsky, and that the voices were that of God. He's out there. Oh, yeah. Well, he's either BSing to get an insanity, or he's truly, he's out there. He might be out there. Sutcliffe pled guilty to seven charges of attempted murder. The prosecution intended to accept his plea after four Mm -hmm. psychiatrists diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia, but the trial judge, Justice Sir Leslie Borum, demanded an unusually detailed explanation of the prosecution's reasoning. Okay. So they were going to accept it, and this judge was like, you need to explain to me why you're accepting Yeah, why, why would we go with this route? Because obviously he was – it's kind of hard to throw an insanity plea because everything he did was premeditated. Right. I mean, seemingly would have had to have been premeditated, right? Yeah, I mean, he knew what he was doing. It wasn't like it just happened. Right. Per se. Like he went out looking to find someone to do this. To, yeah. You know, it's yeah. right. After a two hour representation by the attorney general, a 90 minute lunch break and another 40 minutes of legal discussion, the judge rejected the diminished responsibility oh. plea and the expert testimonies of the psychiatrists. Wow. Insisting that the case should be dealt with by a jury. He wanted this guy to go away. I like he, this yeah, judge, man. Yeah, he wanted him to, yeah. I like this dude. He's like, nope, it's nope. going to a jury, friends. He's, he's definitely not a liberal. 
Um, the trial was set to commence on May 5th, 1981. The trial lasted two weeks, and despite the efforts of his counsel, uh, Sutcliffe was found guilty of murder on all counts and was sentenced to 20 concurrent sentences of life imprisonment. 20 concurrent? Sentences. 20 concurrent. The jury rejected the evidence of four psychiatrists who gave testimony that Sutcliffe had paranoia, paranoid schizophrenia, uh, possibly influenced by the evidence of a prison officer who heard him say to his wife that if he convinced people he was mad, he might get 10 years in the loony bin. So he, you. he knew. So his, his bunkie in jail, he heard him telling his wife, well, I'm just, if I can convince him that I'm crazy, yeah, I'll just have to do a little bit of time in a loony bin and I'll be out. I'll be out. Yeah. So that kind of screwed him there. Justice Borum stated that Suff Sutcliffe was beyond redemption and hoped he would never leave prison. He recommended a minimum term of 30 years to be served before parole could even be considered. Wow. Meaning Sutcliffe would have been unlikely to be freed until at least 2011. This is 81. Yeah. He'd so be 2011. Man. Yeah. On July 16th, 2010. So a year before <laughs> the high court issued Sutcliffe with a whole life tariff. Meaning he was never to be never released. come out. Yeah. So man, I just I find it funny that yeah. this dude was probably thinking, well, next year, next year, and they wait maybe until I can, that last minute. Maybe I can convince them. Yeah, and then all of a sudden you're not going out. <laughs> just love, love. oh oh yeah, next year you're supposed to get out. Well, hang on a second, we need to serve you with this piece yeah, of paper. Yeah, this paper here. By the way, that's a whole life tariff. That that means you're screwed, buddy. Sorry. Yeah. Have a good night. <laughs> yeah. After his trial, Sutcliffe uh, admitted to two other attacks. It was oh. decided that prosecution for these offenses was not in the public interest. I think just spending the money. Probably. Especially now he's got this whole life. You tariff. got him. You right. got him. What's the point? Right. Uh, West Yorkshire police made it clear that the victims wished to remain anonymous. Damn. Looks bad there. Yeah. He did not age well whatsoever. Oh, well, most people don't. They go to prison. That's true. It wears on you, I think. Yeah. Quite a bit. As crazy as you may seem, I don't think anybody wants to really wants to be in prison. No. Nope. So Sutcliffe, he died at University Hospital of North Durham at the age of 74 on November 13th, 2020. But he just passed away a few Jeez, years ago. Man, he, he is, uh, yeah. Um. He had just returned to the prison following treatment for a suspected heart attack at the same hospital two weeks prior. He had a number of underlying health problems, including obesity and diabetes. Um, a private funeral ceremony was held and Sutcliffe's body was cremated. Crazy story, man. Yeah. Crazy he, story. He didn't deserve to go anywhere for people to go mourn him. Yeah. I wonder, I wish I could have found more like a private funeral ceremony. I wonder if anybody was there. I think his wife was there. Or anybody? Or do you think it was just like a chaplain reading his last rites? And I would hope it was just a chaplain reading his last rites. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. But who knows? Mm -hmm. You know what time it is, Mike? Oh, 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 oh. Uh-oh. Oh. I got, don't, don't, I, I've don't, got good news. Don't say a word. Just let's Did, go on. But I have good news, Mike. What? We have a way for people to sign up to play the uh, Wheel of Death. <laughs> if you've never watched the show before, we play the Wheel of Death at the end of every... Well, we tried to play tried the Wheel to. of Death. Try to. Um, but we need people to sign up to play. And we'll FaceTime you in and have you on our Jumbotron. And we'll spin our giant wheel uh, for prizes, such as t-shirts, free memberships. Um, or you could get death. Yeah. Death. Which happens quite frequently, even though it's the smallest. Only when Andy. Thing. <laughs> right. So if you're interested in playing the Wheel of Death, um, please go to our website, twomurdermorons.com slash Wheel of Death. Sign up there, and then we'll throw your name in the bucket of doom. And I'm telling you, if you do it right now, you'll be the only one. So you'll have to yeah. be the one that gets drawn. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, head to the website, or if you're watching, you can scan the QR code on your screen. Hopefully we'll get some. I know we'll get some people soon. Yep. We have to. It's just the rule of... And uh -huh. make sure you uh, subscribe, like, all that good stuff on your uh, whatever you're watching, listening to us on. Yeah. So uh, every bit of that helps. Yeah. Follow us. Yeah. Like us. Leave a comment. Comment. We yeah. respond to every comment. Well, we try. Right now we can respond. Hopefully we get to a point where we wake up tomorrow and there's 
five thousand. I was gonna say like hundred and fifty million comments. Yeah. I had to be like, ooh. I have to oh, man. Right. Take a week off the full time job to respond yeah, to all of them. <laughs> I have to hire somebody to read these for us. And if you enjoyed this episode and you want to support the show, um, head on over to buymeacoffee.com slash two murder morons. If you're watching, you can scan the QR code on your screen. Um, there we do our memberships. They start at $3 a month. You'll get bonus episodes. We do a new bonus episode every other Friday. Um, and then there's other levels where you can get uh, producer recognition, get your name on the screen, on the website, all that good stuff. But Check out Buy Me a Coffee uh, for all those options if you want to support the show. Three bucks. Three bucks. Three bucks. Uh, I mean, less than a Starbucks. Less than a Starbucks. Yeah. Yep. Also, another way to support the show is merch. Merch. Head to our website, grab you some merch t shirt, hoodie, hat, underwear. Yeah, underwear. <laughs> Believe it or not, we do have underwear. Puzzles. Yep. We have a bunch of random stuff on there, but at least go check it out and yeah, grab, check it out. grab Get some. Get a t shirt. You wear it around. You, have, you guys do some uh, free publicity for the show. Yeah. Be a, be a little billboard for yeah, us. That would be awesome. That would be great. Because I guarantee you people will ask. I, I have people ask me. So I know people will ask like, oh, I like podcasts. What's that? Yeah. And then you can be like, it's the best damn true crime podcast I've ever seen or heard. Yeah. Check them out. Check them out. They're in the top 10. Also, once again, if you're listening to our podcast right now, consider watching on YouTube or Spotify. And if you're watching and prefer to listen, we can be found on any of the major platforms that are showing on your screen right now. Also, have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, we used Wikipedia article on this uh, Peter Sutcliffe gentleman to research and uh, read from from this episode. Peter Sutcliffe. So give uh, give Wikipedia some love. We've put a link to that article in the bottom of the description. Peter Sutcliffe. Another one out of the way, Mike. Another one. Man, season one's almost over. It is. I'm sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, there will be a there. Ha there's a season two, right? Oh, those definitely. Okay. Yeah, uh, you're making me nervous. No, like, no, no. It'll Season one was going to be it. No, 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 no. Okay. There'll be more. I hope so. Yeah. I want there to be more. Yeah. Up until, like, let's see, what year is it? 24. <laughs> God, are we mathing right now? I'd like to at least have, uh, for maybe 20 more years, seasons. 20 years? Yeah. I would like to have 20 more twenty more years worth of seasons. God, so that's 60 seasons. Yeah, no. Are we going to make it to season 60? Oh, I might. Uh, yeah, we'll make it. <laughs> As he croaks right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've only got other issues, so <laughs> my underlying issues right now are just other things, not heart. Yeah. So, God, I hope we don't yeah. go that bad. Well, uh, tune in next Wednesday to see if Mike's here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's going to be like every Wednesday. Let's see if Mike's there. <laughs> so definitely subscribe so you get notified and then, you know. See if Mike's going to make it. See if he's here or if he's been replaced. <laughs> right. I don't know who you'd replace me with. <laughs> You're irreplaceable. By the dog. Oh, my God. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next Wednesday. See you. See you.